everyone. I'm going to get started so we can honor the time set by uh, on our agenda. Um, my name is Don Griswold. I am the uh, chair of the Unified, uh, the new Unified Board. And on behalf of the board, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. It's a little warmer, so it's not quite as cold. Um, and I just want to go over a few details before we get started. Uh, because the board's all together, we have to warn this meeting, and I'll, there are a few board items that I have to go through as a formality to get us started. So I'm going to call the meeting to order. I'll run through the public comment. But when we get to the presentation, we can be a little more relaxed in our practice. Um, and I just want to let you know we're planning to end as close to 8.30 as we can tonight. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentation, you can um, step up to a mic if, uh, so everybody can hear, or if you can speak loudly from your, your seat, go ahead and do that. Um, but, uh, for the record, if you just state your name before you ask your question, it's, it helps to keep track of um, things for us and for everybody else around. Kind of thing. Um, let's see. So as we get closer to 8:30, there uh, we'll let you know about the exit survey. We're just asking everybody to take a minute or two and fill out that survey before you leave to provide us with some information about what you thought about tonight's presentation. Uh, and you can pass it to a board member, or you can pop it in the box in the back of the room. Okay. So at this point. I will call the meeting to order at 634. Um, I'd like to take a minute to introduce the board members that are present. There are a few missing, uh, so if we start at that end. There's a microphone on the end of the table right there. Right there, Betsy. <laughs> Allison Sertive at Bristol. Hi, I'm Krista Seringo from Bristol. Erin Lathrop, I'm also from Bristol. Steve Rooney from Starksboro. Liz Sue from Bristol. Jen Stanley, Moncton. Andrew Borden, New Haven. And as I said, I'm John Griswold and I'm from Moncton. Um, at this time, is there any public comment? Will we be able to make comments at the end also? Yes. Okay. Yes. change is always gorgeous in the end. And sometimes it can lead to um, unfortunate consequences. And I think that looking at the teachers who are being riffed um, and, re and um, the staff that you're thinking of hiring, I have a comment. According to this um, budget presentation, you are removing about six core classroom teachers and about 1.6 special area teachers and about a dozen assistants. All of these are directly working with students in the classroom. You are adding 6.3 of something called coordinators, coaches, interventionists, build a support system. Traditionally, I understand that the principals working together with the staff build their own support system. I am discouraged that you are removing people from the classroom. And if that is necessary, be better to have people in the classroom than um, an equal number of 
coordinators, instructors, coaches, interventionists who are not in the classroom. When I've taken courses, I have found that it's the staff who are in the classroom, those who are teaching us, in my experience, it, I have found that it's the teachers in the classroom or the assistants who are helping you who make the difference. The people who are peripheral to this do not have the, the direct um, effect on improving the student's education that the people in the classroom do. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start out. So, uh, as uh, Ms. Tilburg mentioned, uh, things are, you're going to hear about tonight are, are going to be talking about a change, and there, it's a change from what you've heard in the past. So, we, we, we like this thought to remember change is hard at first, and messy in the middle, and gorgeous at the end. How did we get here? Uh, so this year, at many of the meetings that I attended or other school board members attended, hosted by the VSBA or uh, other groups that um, host meetings for us, we received a lot of information that you're going to hear about tonight. So uh, if we go to the next one. So from the governor's office, we heard the, the message of of all these things. And if, if we start at the top and talk about the 631, that's the, that represents six, the six fewer workers in the workforce, three fewer K-12 students, and one baby born exposed to opiates every day. Cradle to Career is the governor's education vision on a continuum of learning for students that would develop skills to be successful at work, home, and in the community, and make better use of our existing resources. The $80 million hole. Last year, lawmakers uh, used, agreed to use a one-time surplus money re reserves to, to buy down property taxes. So this pushed problems with the education funding down the road, and here we are, and, looking at this budget, trying to deal with that problem. The Agency of Education is projecting that there's not enough tax revenue currently uh, to make up for that hole, so uh, they're going to need to increase taxes. Um, the governor has recently been talking about a tax increase in somewhere between eight and 12 cents. So we've been thinking about that. Another thing we've been thinking about is the declining population. Um, we have, and we've been hearing that message for many years. It, in the last 25 years, the student population has declined by 30,000 students. So, another thing we're thinking about in the back of our mind. The other thing we're thinking about is um, increasing poverty. Last year, Vermont was the only state to experience an increase in the poverty rate. Uh, so poverty rates rose from 10.2% to 11.9%. And that, that translates to more than 71,000 Vermonters living below the official poverty le level of income. So Governor Scott is focusing his work on making Vermont more affordable, growing the economy, and protecting the vulnerable. Okay. The Agency of Education, what have you been hearing from them? The, the similar message about the declining enrollment. Um, the, there are less students in the system, and when you have less students, uh, that causes the cost per pupil to grow. So fewer students without an adjustment in staff causes the difference in the staff to student ratio. Uh, there was a report commissioned by the legislature done by the DMG, a district management group, and they began their work look, with the goal of to sort of provide a roadmap for the state as a whole to more effectively and cost effectively serve students who struggle. 
So the ultimate goal c goes well beyond just issuing the report, but, but rather to sort of spur a sustained effort to raise achievement, expand services, and manage cost. So more messages we've been receiving. So with all that in mind, on the next slide, on October 24th, the Mount Abraham board met, um, considering all these, <coughs> and began looking at putting a plan together to, to produce or to have a budget for the, the Unified School District, the first budget. So we gave direction to the superintendent to begin building the budget with no increase to the cost per equalized pupil for the, from the 2017-2018 budget. It was, it was a tough decision. There was a lot of back and forth. We discussed it at length. And even at the last meeting last month, we again went through back and forth about was this, you know, could we do this? What, what is it going to look like in this school district? So there was a lot of thought, a lot of consideration into this target that we gave the superintendent to, to reach to build the budget. So the information you will see next is a look at what the superintendent has done to meet the board's target and what it means to our schools and our community. I'm going to try without the mic because I'm told my voice projects all right. Can everybody hear in the back okay? Okay. Uh, just let me know if you can't hear at some point and I'll grab the mic. But I tend to be somewhat mobile when I'm presenting and a wired mic makes that a challenge. Uh, so as Don said, uh, the board set the target of no increase in the cost per equalized pupil from the current year that we're in now, 17-18, to next year, which is 18-19. So affectionately known as FY18 that we're in now, FY19 is next year's budget. And you'll see that represented in some of these slides. So here's what that means in dollars. So that means our target, given our equalized pupil number, which is finally, we think, settled. That's, that equalized pupil number is kind of a moving thing. Uh, and we believe those are now firmed up. Uh, so given the equalized pupils that we have, which is um, 1,510.41 equalized pupils, um, at this year's spending per equalized pupil gives us this figure here. So ultimately that is the education spending target that I needed to try and hit. And so to begin with, we had to think about, well, if we didn't make any changes in staffing or programming or any of that, how many dollars does that equate to that we would need to find to realize that target? And it amounts to $1,177,000 in education spending savings that we have to find. You're going to hear a lot of terms that sound funny, um, and they're really important, but they're connected to, um, to some things that kind of make sense. So equalized pupil is the first thing I would throw out there. Equalized pupil is a weighted number of students. So there's a formula that recognizes that different students require different levels of support to educate. And so there are a number of factors that the state looks at to recognize the difference in what it takes to educate children. Those factors uh, are included in a formula that produces an equalized pupil number to help adjust for those costs associated with the added uh, support that students need. So equalized pupil is something you'll hear me talk a lot about because the equalized pupil number drives spending. It drives uh, tax rates that drives all those things. So it's really important in terms of building a budget. Uh, the other thing that you heard me mention was education spending. So education spending is total expenses, all the money you spend in education, minus the revenue you get from various sources, and the difference then is education spending. Uh, and targets that, that we have, uh, that have been set by the board, but also spending thresholds that come from the state, are all connected to education spending. So that's expenses, less revenue. So as we're talking through some of these things, those are the terms you'll hear me use most often. And if you need me to repeat or, or talk that through again at any point, just let me know. So that's a lot of money. It's, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Um, and in, in having done some of the work to think about how we might realize that, um, I've developed a belief that we can really reimagine the way we serve students. We need to reimagine the way we serve students. We certainly can't keep doing the same kind of work with fewer resources 
and think that that's the way to improve outcomes for students. I also think that the, the new unified school district, the Mount Abraham Unified School District, will emerge strong from this and prepared to improve outcomes. So the challenge really is to improve outcomes for students while spending less money than we are this current fiscal year, FY18. And so we can't achieve that by maintaining staffing. We can't achieve that by operating the same way with fewer resources. Uh, this guy's definition of insanity comes to mind when we think about trying to do the same thing over and over and expect different results. Certainly, it applies if we're trying to do the same thing with fewer resources and expecting improved results. It just doesn't seem to hold true that that would happen. So there's an opportunity presented as well. Um, so we have an opportunity to make some changes in the results we get. So the, the evidence pre um, presented in the ENDS report, um, so the ENDS report is a monitoring report that I have to produce with lots of help from lots of people uh, for the board as evidence of whether or not we're meeting the ENDS that the board has set forth for me to, to, to achieve. Uh, so that looks at a variety of things. It includes a lot of assessments, um, some more national assessments, some local assessments, and the evidence in that ENDS report suggests that our students are not achieving at the level that we want them to or that we think they can and certainly that we believe we can get them to. So there's some evidence that we need to do something different. Um, and that prompts us to, to be able to redesign the way we support students, faculty, and staff. We need to build support throughout the organization to ensure that we're getting those improved outcomes. Uh, and again, we can improve outcomes for students and meet this budget target. So part of what's going to help us do that is the flexibility we have now as, an, as a single district. So we have more flexibility as a single district than we've ever had uh, operating as really seven different districts. Uh, and we're, we need to capitalize on that flexibility to be able to use resources efficiently and effectively to improve outcomes and doing so with fewer resources. We also have really intelligent, dedicated, hardworking, and caring faculty and staff. We have a great leadership team. And we have a wonderful five-town community who's really invested in improving outcomes. So, where do we go from here? Well, we know we can't become what we need to be by staying what we are. So that kind of, that's another spin on that definition of insanity where we have to do things differently than the way we're doing them now if we wish to achieve what it is we want to achieve, which I think we would all agree is improved outcomes for students. That's why we're here. And so how do we begin thinking about that? Well, a timber stand improvement analogy comes to mind for me. So when homeowners are thinking about how they might improve their, um, improve their woodlands, they're thinking about what is it I want to get out of these woodlands? What are we trying to produce? And I need to make decisions around what I want to grow within my woodlands as we make decisions about what doesn't get to stay in the woodlands. If you're, if you're trying to do some timber stand improvement to improve your maple sugar works, you're going to be thinking about what needs to come out of the, of the woodlands to allow the sugar works to grow and produce the best that it can. So as we're having to think about what can't stay, we have to think about what are our focus areas and how do we use that information to make decisions about what stays, what goes, and what we want to grow as we make these decisions. So rather than simply start from a deficit model of what do we have to cut, we started as an admin team thinking about what do we need to grow? And how can we grow in the areas we need to while still having to make the reductions that we're going to have to make to hit the budget target. And so with that, um, that analogy sort of in mind, we then thought about, so what are those focus areas? Obviously, number one, first and foremost, improving outcomes for students. That is the focus area. That is primary. Yeah. Yeah, so, the, so I think about the range of assessments that are within the, um, the ENDS report. So that includes things like the SBAC and NECAPS and things like that that are more standardized tests. But we also have some local assessments. Uh, we look at students connected with the community, um, job embedded sort of um, learning, things like that. Those are all the kinds of things that are referenced in the ENDS report um, that we can improve upon. Patrick? 
Are there outcomes related to faculty and staff as well? How do you mean? Um, longevity of tenure, professional development, degree, collaborative teaching, those kind of things. Not in the end report. Um, so the end report really focuses on outcomes for students. And those would be sort of means to achieve outcomes for students, perhaps. Got it. <coughs> mm. Having sat in on a few of these, we've gone through, and I'd love somebody from the board to explain, how many of these changes that were going to improve the outcome for students, and I'm wondering, what are you going to do to judge this one in a year from now if improvements have not been made Will we be reverting back to a program that was working better, or we will simply go off in another direction yet again? So I'm a little skeptical. Sure. It's OK to be skeptical. We all need to be skeptical as we think about these changes. And it's that skepticism that was going to force us to pay attention to those outcomes. And the reality is, when we're making significant change, like the scale of change we're talking about making, it's not a one-year thing, and you're going to see a dramatic turnaround in outcomes for students. It's something that takes years to continue to sort of perfect and get to a point where we see that begin to turn. So research on organizational change is five to seven years. This isn't a, isn't a one year thing. And just to, John will get after me if I don't remind folks, if you can just state your name sure. uh, so that he's trying to capture questions and may want to follow up, then he'll know. It's Mark Rickner, Moncton. Five to seven years ago, did we put changes into place that were supposed to improve education and outcomes? And did those changes improve education and outcome? From what you're telling us today, the changes that were made five to seven years ago, we should be seeing an improvement from. Are we? I haven't looked at the data from seven years ago to be able to speak right now to how that change has happened. But I would say, based on where we are right now, we're certainly not where we want to be. And then I'm going to take your analogy one step further. From what I can see here, the only thing that's being removed are people who are actually dealing with students, teachers, and aides. And I'll just use your analogy and say you are introducing an invasive species, a group of people that don't actually work with students, that are going to be teaching people who already are teachers. So I like your analogy, but I'm going to say that you've added something new to the equation. Okay, we're going to talk more about some of those changes and the philosophy behind it a little bit later, so hang on to those questions and we'll dig deeper into that. So, focus area number one. That's how far we made it, I think, on this list. Improving outcomes for students. We also, for the first time, more so than ever before, we need to take a focus on, we have a focus on equity. So we have one budget for all six of our schools now. And we need to be thinking about how do we allocate resources equitably across those schools because it shouldn't matter which town you're, you reside in within our five towns in terms of what you get for an educational experience. We need to ensure that we have equity in resources, equity in outcomes for students across the schools. Um, more so now than ever with the passage of Act 46 and being a unified district. We also really need to focus on support for faculty and staff so that we know that the work that's happening in the classrooms with students, which is absolutely the most essential work, is the best that it can be. Um, and historically, you know, teachers going off to a one or two day workshop coming back, that kind of ongoing, that kind of professional development tends to not, to not transform teaching instruction. It has to be something that's much more ongoing um, and embedded in the work that's happening in the classroom to really transform instruction. We also need to build sustainable systems. So um, when I first arrived here, there was a, um, a group of folks that had done a lot of work with the relationships by objective. And one of the significant findings that came out of this work, which was a combination of administrators, board members, teachers, uh, support staff, sort of a range of folks, and quite a number of folks. I wasn't involved in it, but 30-some folks, probably, something like that. Um, one of the significant findings was there's a lack of systems in Addison Northeast. And that lack of systems is having an impact on our ability to achieve those ends and many other things. So building those sustainable systems, really important as we think about moving this forward. And we need to find efficiencies. Um, that's something that we're hearing loud and clear from taxpayers, is the cost of education is growing more and more unaffordable. We need to find some efficiencies as we work to improve outcomes. So keeping those uh, areas in mind, 
um, and using some resources. We didn't just pull lots of things out of thin air as we were looking at this. We referred to the education quality standards, the Picus Noden report and the DMG report that Don referenced earlier. Those offer lots of great information that looks more broadly across, across the state, does some comparisons to other states. It offers some ratios for suggestions. Um, they were great resources as we worked through how exactly can we go about achieving this. So as we think about building that comprehensive system of supports, we need to think about it from the student perspective, both from the social emotional support, as well as the academic support. And when we think about supporting adults, we need to be thinking about how can we support the use of best practices in the classroom, and how can we support the use of data on an ongoing basis to know the impact our teaching has on outcomes for kids. If we don't know the impact our teaching has on outcomes for kids, how can we know if it's working or not? And how can we make those mid-course corrections that might need to be made to continue to improve outcomes? As I mentioned before, we have to also think about equity, both in opportunities for students, but also in outcomes for students. And there are a lot of different angles to this concept of equity as we look at allocating resources and we look at outcomes for students. And we're going to need to take a look at all of those angles as we figure out where we go. And we need to make sure that this system is really integrated and articulated. Um, special education for a long time has, in some, in some people's perspective, been seen as sort of a separate system within the system. We really need to be thinking about that as a piece of the system really integrated in the work of supporting students and meeting students' needs. And we really need to make sure that the systems are articulated pre-K through 12. So they really capture the whole, the whole system that we're focusing on. So how do we rethink and redesign the way we use the most greatest resource in our budget, which is the faculty and staff, so that we can achieve better outcomes for students according to the priorities that are set? Well, the first thing we need to do is refer to what those priorities are. So some things that we can look at in terms of what the priorities are. We're in the process of creating a strategic plan. It's, it's well underway, but it's not complete. One thing that is complete is we have goals in these areas. They're very broad goals, and the details are what are still being worked on right now. But we can look to these to help us understand the priorities. So expertise and learning is uh, one area of the strategic plan. Social emotional learning and physical development, equity, and community. So those broad categories can help give us some perspective on what are their priorities and how can we grow. We can also look to the uh, multi-tiered system of supports field guide. Uh, this is something that's used more broadly than just in Edison Northeast. This is a Vermont thing. Um, and it suggests these categories to be paying attention to as you grow your system. And think about developing a system of supports for students. This is something that was developed um, fairly recently, maybe three or four years ago. Katrina would know better than I. Is that about right? I see Susan nodding. So three or four years ago, this graphic was created to help also think a little differently about what are the priorities. So we have our friend Stu, Stu Dent, in the center. He is the priority, right? Surrounding him, we have this concept of personalized learning. Within a proficiency-based learning system, in a multi-tiered system of support, focused on achieving the ends set forth by the board. It's another way to sort of understand the way in which we organize some priorities around meeting students' needs. So as we look to those and we think about, so what is an instructional support model that focuses in those areas that we need to focus on and connects to these priorities that we've, that we've identified and established? Well, we know that this instructional support model needs to be part of a clearly articulated system. We know that it has to focus on student achievement and collaboration throughout the school district. It has to have clearly defined roles and responsibilities, and it has to develop expertise throughout MAUSD. This is where it comes back to that idea that sending, sending folks off to one or two day conferences, expecting that that will transform instruction, it just doesn't happen. We've been doing that and doing that and doing that. That doesn't transform instruction. Ongoing, embedded professional development transforms instruction. Um, and there's a continuum of these practices. You're not necessarily either doing them or not doing them, right? So our ability to implement best practices grows as we continue to get support and we practice those in our classrooms. It's no different than when we're introducing new concepts to students. Uh, they grow and they move along this continuum of their ability to meet the standards and 
and demonstrate knowledge in those areas. This instructional support model also really needs to build and maintain capacity within and among the stakeholders. So again, it's about building our own capacity. Um, and those stakeholders being leadership, as well as curriculum coordinators, the instructional coaches, teachers and other instructors, interventionists and special educators, and other students and um, systems of support. So support staff, volunteers, community partners, etc. It needs to develop the capacity and support all of the stakeholders within the organization. So let me take a pause here before we dive into the numbers. That's sort of the philosophy. That's, that's the approach that we've been taking as we've thought about how we might be able to achieve the budget target while finding ways to create systems to improve outcomes for students. Yeah? I have a question about that last one. Um, does that mean that the people who are going to be in the classroom as teachers, assistants, will they have a way to understand what any applicants are about, like what their goals are and their strategies and stuff like that, so they have an they kind of have an idea, a way to input who comes to do this for them? You know, I don't know if there's a possibility, but... Uh, so I think you're talking about specifically the people who fill the positions to provide the support, and what's the process to, through filling those? Uh, yeah, I mean, so typically when there's a position being filled, there's a small group of folks that try to have a representative sample of you know, various positions that meet to review applicants and interview and all that stuff so that we have sort of a broad perspective on who fills the positions to do that work. And that would be true of any position that we'd be filling. all anxious to get into the numbers, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, Julie Clark, Crystal. I'm wondering if the ends are something that we're going to be reevaluating as well as, um, as part of that reinventing what we're doing to achieve different results. It seems like we keep coming back to that. Um, and some of those ends are really uh, traditional testing methods. I know some of them are not, um, and they're broader than that. Um, but how much reevaluating are we doing with that ends policy? So it's sort of interesting. This conversation came up when we were generating the, um, when we were generating the vision for um, what is now MAUSD. We didn't know it was going to be MAUSD at the time. Um, and the conversation about the ends came up, and what do we do about the ends? They were somewhat recently um, drafted, and there was an extensive process in collecting community input um, and really thinking through what those ends should be. And we thought, through the policy governance process, rather than having to redraft the ends policy, we had an opportunity to, re to think differently about what the ends mean in drafting a new interpretation of the ends. So the way the policy governance works is, at least for the policies that are my responsibility, there's the language of the policy, and then there's an interpretation of the policy drafted, and then that interpretation gets approved by the board, and then I draft a monitoring report according to the interpretation, more so even than according to the policy. And we do have a brand new interpretation of the ENDS that looks at it more broadly and encompasses things that haven't historically been encompassed in an ENDS report. So already this year for the first time, we've written an ENDS report, looks very different than any other ENDS report we've had, that emphasizes less, although it's still there and it's still important, those NECAP and SBAC scores, um, and looks at some other measures as well. So we're gonna continue to do that work and we need to continue to think about what's the data we need to pay attention to to tell us whether or not we're headed in the right direction. Uh, can I put you on the spot? Can you give us a really juicy example of some of those fresh, new, um, broader outcomes? I'm looking to Katrina to help me jog my memory. So how is the idea for what now? For something other than a standardized assessment to look at outcomes for students. Oh, like a performance-based assessment? So I think so. An idea that comes to mind for me is looking at um, age of legality scores, um, which are locally developed assessment administered by age of legality teachers, and we picked age of legality because in, in one part, everyone takes that. 
it gets tricky toward the upper grades to find an assessment that everybody takes that isn't a kneecap or an SBAC or something like that. Um, and age of legality happened to be one of those. I don't know that that's as juicy as you're looking for, but that was the one that came to mind for me. Oh, sorry. I don't know if it's appropriate for me to chime in at all, but um, and I don't know if this is at all what you were maybe trying to get at, Julie, but I think the work of the Strategic Planning Committee um, is really valuable in translating these really broad ends into five goals that are going to be fleshed out for the students of today and the next five to ten years, and, and those conversations are right with um, new ways to look at, you know, what does success mean for students now? And the variation that that um, entails. And so I think as a board member, I'm really excited about and looking forward to working through that plan as a way to gauge our success and to know if um, what we're setting out to do now um, is connected to those goals in a real way and not these sort of abstract concepts that were developed five or ten years ago. So I just wanted to add that piece. And what I might add on to that, so these are the, the four broad areas and so for each of these there's an action team, there's a team of folks uh, from seven or eight to ten or twelve people on each of these teams um, focus on, on the goal for this area. So expertise and learning, you know, that might, they might produce some things that we need to pay attention to that are similar to what we already have in the ENDS report. So we'd be looking at the standardized tests and some other local assessments. Um, but the fact that we have a social, emotional learning and physical development focus will produce some assessments that maybe aren't a part of the ENDS report right now. So something will grow from that. I also think about equity um, and thinking about what assessments, what can we be paying attention to to tell us if we're meeting these equity goals? And so the ability to measure some of these is really important, and it will absolutely influence what happens uh, in terms of what gets reported in the ends. And certainly the community and, and the way we engage or we connect students with the community. And how can we measure our success in that area? So we're headed in the direction of breaking away from, although keeping, because they're not, inv they're not uh, unvaluable, those standardized assessments. They're a piece of the pie. They can't, they're not the whole pie. Uh, and this, these are going to help us sort of round that out. I was just wondering, in this presentation, are you going to, at some point, go into detail about what an instructional coach is, what their role will be, what the criteria will be for hiring, will they be certified teachers, will they have classroom experience, will they be, you know, what is their role? I mean, to me, this is the biggest change you're doing, and I, so far I haven't heard any description about what this is or what the criteria will be for hiring. So some of those details we'll be addressing. You know, the, um, we'll see if we get in enough detail when we get to that point. Yeah. Patty Beverly Bristol. Uh, I'm concerned about the, uh, the introduce the word assessment and, and as if that was the determination of being successful. And I'm wondering about the five years down the line after a student graduates to collect data out there. Don't ask me what, you know. What, what would the criteria be? But that's something to talk about. That you, I'm, I'm a, I taught for over 30 years at a public high school here in Vermont, and, and, and I realized that there's something beyond high school that's very important. And I know you want to be able to see something in the process within the 12 or 13 years when we have students here, but it's very important to look beyond. I couldn't agree more. Uh, that happens to be the most difficult information to collect because <laughs> it's hard to kind of kind of wrap your hands around folks once they're five years out. But for the first time in the ENDS report this year, we included some stories of folks that are several years out of high school um, and just did sort of a narrative on where they are, what are they doing to try and give sort of a, at least an element of that. Well, the, the technology being the way it is, it's, I don't think it's as hard as it used to be in like 30 years ago. Probably not. <coughs> um, Kathy Martell, Virgins, but I <coughs> um, with that last piece, Patrick, did you also then look back at how they scored in high school? 
how those SBAC tests did, how they did on the NECAP. And with all these standardized testing, kids, I mean, I have a perfect example in my home where somebody did not do well on testing, that's just not who they were. And now in life, years down the road, is very successful. So the standardized testing may not mean who we're gonna be 20 years from now, or 10 years from now, or five years from now, or just the other way around. You've got people that can test out great, and sorry, but don't have a look at common sense and don't do anything with their lives, you know, productively. So is that part of that? So I don't disagree with anything you said. <laughs> um, with the folks that I referenced in the ENDS report, we didn't do that. The sample size is way too small. I'll tell like it, we just couldn't go there with the three or four stories that we had in the ENDS report. Uh, but that notion that test scores are not everything, 100% completely agree with you on that. They're also not nothing. So they have to be part of what we're looking at as we determine are we achieving what we want to achieve in terms of outcomes for students. We have to look at it much more than just that, but that's part of it. Tom Darling, Bristol. Um, um, I like standardized tests. I mean, I know it's not the whole picture, but I mean, part of it is accountability. I've been hearing since the kneecap started and the scores were low, that there was more to the story than just these numbers. And I don't disagree. Those numbers, these, the kneecap tests and now the SBAC tests are good tests. They very accurately tell us things about who can do math, who can read, who can write, and their objective, local scoring. No, we don't have people who are trained solely in testing and uh, measurement design. It's sort of, uh, it's imperfect, I'll say that. And it's local, um, and it's subjective. I'm wondering about accountability, because now it's been 10 years or so, with no child left behind, and, Numbers still don't look great. I mean, they're below the state average. So I'm wondering, so you're putting these people in, these positions that are supposed to <coughs> change things and coach. Is there an accountability to them? Is there accountability where we're gonna say, this is, what we're, this is the numbers we're getting, or if we're using these other measurements, this is the measurement that we expect to get. Yeah, the, the accountability is outcomes for students as reported in that end report. Which you looks at those standardized scores and but others. Before, but beforehand, you're gonna say, this is our goal, and then did we meet that goal? Because I, I, your report's out every year, but I, I don't really get a lot of people going, our goal for next year is this, and this is what we're gonna do to achieve it. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. We haven't gone as far as to have those conversations to say, is that the process we're gonna use? It makes sense to set measurable goals and then measure and see if you're hitting that goal or not. So. That approach makes sense to me. We haven't had that level of conversation yet. Yeah. My name's Julie Olson. I'm from New England. Um, I'm not an educator. I know a lot of people in here are, so I just want to say I'm a community member. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts. The, I feel really, I feel uh, compassion for all of you where you're every single year you're put in this difficult situation from the state trying to fight for money to educate our children. It makes me really sad. And it's not that way in other states. Other states, they just spend the money. And I hope we never get to a place like Texas where teachers are fired if they don't, if their children don't test well. And the, and the months that they spend on trying to train their kids to take the test, it's not right. And I appreciate how Vermont does do that. But I also have been in education here in the district and have watched over the last several years and every year it changes. We, the ENDS policy changes every year because everything has to change every year. Five years ago, everything was changing. And so how do you get your ground? You never get the base anymore because you're always just grappling at trying to stay afloat to make a budget that's unrealistic <coughs> and Educate our kids. Educate our kids. That's our business. Educating our kids. And we're failing at it across the board. And then you talked about the um, how much our um, the money piece has changed for children. Poverty level has changed for children. That's that 
that's we're in a crisis there because now they have struggled to learn because where am I going to eat? Where am I going to sleep? You know what's happening at home? So that's just even a higher thing. So I think it's just really hard. I sit in these meetings every single year where you're fighting for money and fighting for the right thing. Everybody, we're all here because we care about kids and our community. And I just feel like what you're planning on is we're going to be re-talking about it next year, the year after, and starting all over. And it's just you know it's just really frustrating that this is where we are every single year. Well, and that's the hope with the strategic planning process. Uh, so as Krista mentioned, the strategic plan will be a five-year plan. Like we need to commit to something and kind of hold the course as best we can over the course of, uh, of time and looking at it as a five-year plan, you have to really give something that much time to begin to see the impact. Um, but you're never given that time. You are never, not like you specifically, but as a whole, as, as educators, you are not ever given five years. Think about it. How many plans have you been through? How many times have you been to, in a meeting like this where you're just reinventing the wheel to try and make the money piece work with your student priority? It's hard. And it's interesting. So connected to that, I was at a, I was there too, I think, at a regional um, Vermont School Boards Association meeting down at Otter Valley. Uh, and they were talking about you know the budget cycle. And this was back in October. October. So just the beginning when we were starting to learn a little bit about kind of the position we'd be in for building a budget. And there was an official from the governor's office there, and a board member asked the question, "When are we going to get out of these difficult budget seasons? Like it feels like year after year after year, it's a really difficult budget cycle, just as you're talking about." And the governor, the, the official from the governor's office, said, "To be honest, when Vermont when Vermont starts growing again." Um, the, the demographics for Vermont that Don referenced earlier in, in the presentation are real, and that's creating great concern. And for the long-term uh, benefits for Vermont, if we can't figure out how to turn that around, you know, it, it doesn't spell um, good news for Vermont down the road. So that was his response. Um, how long that'll be? Anybody's guess, I suppose. Yeah. Julie Clark again from Bristol. Is this um, the declining enrollment Statewide, is that also reflected in our local numbers? We're going to take a look at some of the equalized pupil um, changes as well as enrollment changes. Um, they're connected, but they're a little bit different, uh, and they both impact what it is we're trying to do. So you'll see some of that. But it is true, we are seeing the decline in enrollment. And a follow-up question kind of related to that is how much pushback can we give to the state or have we given to the state? I'm kind of new to the district, so I don't know if we... Um, I've sort of heard that we have really followed the course that's come down from the state year after year and maybe some other districts haven't. So where's the, where do you feel like the equity is in that? If we've been following the rules that they've been, or the requests that they've been putting out, is there a point where we can sort of put the brakes on our <coughs> other schools catching up? I mean, so the reality is we do have a lot of control over what we determine our budget to be, and there are consequences for taking whatever action it is. So we can push back to a point, but with the state holding the purse strings, if you exceed whatever spending threshold is set for that particular year, then you can do that. It's not, you know, it's not illegal to do that, but you're penalized pretty significantly for overspending, and then you need taxpayer support to adopt to, to approve that budget and I think historically the thinking has been taxpayer support probably wouldn't follow exceeding the spending threshold which then gets penalized significantly um, for doing so. So you know there's a little bit of, of leeway in terms of what the budget can be but there are consequences for the decisions that are made. Yes? Uh, just, I know you get a million different inputs from parents and it must be overwhelming everyone has a different opinion. <laughs> Uh, but the whole test thing, uh, I just want to say, you know, I have a kid in kindergarten. What are my expectations as a parent? So I just want to say, I'm just looking to develop them as a, a part of the community, as an, a, 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 to develop a love of learning and, and a love of life. And, and I'm so far in kindergarten, what I'm seeing is definitely that. I'm, 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 uh, and the whole test taking thing, uh, for me as a parent, that's not a big concern. Like, that is good at taking some. I know it's a way of measuring, and it's hard to measure otherwise because everything gets fluffy, but uh, <laughs> that's what I'm looking for as a parent. I 
I'm sure I, you know, every parent has a different opinion. But. <laughs> I just want to say um, something about the state picture and, and the picture that the governor is portraying. He's projecting, and Don showed it in one of those early slides, a 50 to $80 million hole. And um, Representative Sharp spoke to this a little bit, I, I believe, in a, in a fairly recent Addison Independent piece. To some degree, that's a, that's a man-made, manufactured crisis that he is talking about. Uh, uh, if I'm, I think I'm correct in saying that about $31 million of that whole was the result of the incentives that were offered to school districts to consolidate. And another part of that whole is comes from um, the governor taking some things that would have been, that have been paid for out of the general fund and putting them into the education fund. Now maybe that's where they belonged all along, but still, to project, you know, to portray it as a crisis of 50 to $80 million hole only really tells a part of the story. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. It was decisions that were made at the state level that created the 50 to $80 million hole. The use of one-time fund, one funds for whatever the purpose was, the result is the same. When you use one-time funds that you can't continue to use in the future, that creates a, a revenue stream that's no longer there that has to be made up for in reductions or increased taxes. But and it isn't just the result of local districts spending too much money on schools or overstaffing for, 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 for that. That's a tiny piece of the whole that the governor has done. I wouldn't disagree. But it doesn't change the fact that we are where we are. I'm David Brennan from Bristol, um, and um, I'm just struggling with this, this notion of standardized testing and personalized learning. Um, so I get, I get the notion of the principles and ideals that you would test for in a standardized test, but personalized learning is about the ability to assimilate stuff and to then to apply it in a way that's effective. And the application of principles and ideals is like the essence of education. That's what John Dewey said, and I think he nailed it. And so I, I've taught at UVM for years, and you see the kids coming in, and they're filled with all the principles and the ideals, but they don't understand how to apply them. And for people who understand how to apply stuff, even if they don't achieve the principles and ideals at a high level, they make really great employees. They get to be really effective people. <coughs> and so what seems to be under uh, appreciated is just how important it is to be able to take the principles and ideals <coughs> and to apply them in an arena that is of personal interest that doesn't really get addressed by standardized tests. Again, I agree with everything you said. <laughs> it's certainly not lost that I completely believe what you're saying to be true. Uh, your, what you know is only as important, or only as good as your ability to apply it to situations. And, and I, I think almost everyone in our educational community would say, yeah, that's what's really important. Um, both what you know and what you can do and how you apply that are really important. And we need to look at both perspectives. I guess the point I'd like to follow up with is that real application doesn't happen within the institution. Real application happens in real life situations. In the community. True. But again, it's, it, we, we mentioned that. But where the rubber really meets the road for people, I went to a Jesuit prep school. I went through all the college, 98% of us went to college and stuff. But for me, where the rubber met the road was where, when I met somebody who knew how to do stuff. And that changed my life. And I feel like our educational system needs to be open to those possibilities, which means that a lot of education, a lot of learning, a lot of application can happen outside of the institution. 
needs to happen out in the community, really happen in the community, not just, just spoken to. And I haven't been sitting in the conversations for the community action team, but my understanding is those are the kinds of things the community action team is talking about. How can we create that? I just really want to add the same for social emotional learning and physical development, that those goals need to have very specific observable outcomes, because it's, it's very real, tangible stuff. Um, and I'd really like to see evidence of that throughout the educational programming, and also evidence of it connected to any um, renovation. It has to all be connected, otherwise it's going to be this fragmented thing, and we'll be back here with the same language each year. Yes. Ready for some numbers about Jerry? I think Jerry, you're with Malcolm. Yeah, it, it seems that there's always room for increasing expertise in learning. Um, and, you know, I, I don't really understand the coaching model, um, but I'll be interested in how that will be implemented. But I, I think that one of the important things to, to um, keep high as a priority is looking at what are the teachers already have a lot of expertise. What's getting in the way of them implementing that? I think there's barriers, and I think that those barriers constantly need to be uh, addressed. So, you know, it's, it's always good to add new expertise, but, you know, let's address the barriers that are keeping um, teachers from implementing what they already know. But it does start with some numbers. So we saw this target before. Um, and we saw this number before, which is if we didn't make any changes. And that produces this amount of money that we would be over the target if we didn't make changes. And so where do those changes come from? Well, of that 1,177, that's how much is a result of staffing changes. We have uh, a new partnership with Addison Northwest uh, School District with our food service, which enables us to reduce our food service subsidy by 22,000 and maintain the same level of, um, of service that we're providing to students. And there was a great article in The Independent. It was about Addison Northwest, but you can say ditto to everything that's happening here, and it began here, and, and it's growing in Addison Northwest. Um, some reductions from repairs and maintenance some reductions by having a single board. And these add up to this amount, and the other 170,000 or so, um, 110,000 or so, is from dozens and dozens of other lines, sort of little parts and pieces. These were the more significant um, contributors to finding that much in savings. And I thought it, was in, it would be worth uh, noting that, so about 73% of the total expense in the budget is from staffing, and 58% of the savings that we needed to find came from staffing. And then, of course, 42% from other places. <laughs> so these are the staffing reductions that are, uh, that are considered at this point. 16.16 uh, .16 FTE support staff, and they come from multiple categories. Some custodial, some special education assistance, some speech language pathology assistance, and some general education assistance. In addition, we have 11.9 FTE reductions in professional positions, and those would be six core classroom teachers, 1.6 special area, 1.0 nurse, 2.5 central office positions, and 0.8 speech language pathology, which is currently filled by um, an online resource, which is presence learning. And we have a reduction of 0.45 FTE administrative positions. Those are building principals and assistant principals. I'm sorry, what did you say about the administrative positions? So this 0 .45 FTE right now is thought to come from assistant principal and principal positions. Do we ask about that in Bristol? When is the time that we talk about those reductions? I have a couple of slides that explain them a little bit more. Maybe once I've gone through that, 
then we can circle back and I'll try to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. So there was some talk earlier. Uh, I think Ms. Tilburg spoke about some of the increases. Um, and we are looking to, uh, again, as we talked about the need to grow in certain areas and to grow systems, we need to have people in positions to be able to grow those systems. These additions are to put people in those positions to grow those systems. And those positions are 6.3, and that's a combination, and we have a lot of work to figure out still, but it's a combination of added coordinator time, which has the perspective across all schools in the school district, coaching positions, um, which will have more limited, they might be in one or one or two schools um, where they have coaching responsibilities, and then interventionists, which are folks that do work directly with students. And these are professional interventionists, um, highly trained to do the intervention work that they would be doing. It also includes an increase of 1.2 special educators. Uh, this is again an, an, uh, an interest in getting kids more access to highly trained interventionists. We see special educators as highly trained interventionists. Um, and so this increases access to those highly trained interventionists. And also, in addition of 1.0 school psychologists, we currently have 1.0. This would add another 1.0. We'll talk more about why these positions in the next slide. So the net reductions that are anticipated um, would be staying at that 16.16 support staff positions. The professional staff positions, the net is a reduction of 3.4 FTE and 0.45 FTE administrative positions for a total anticipated of 20.01 FTE. Can I have one little clarification? It's, sure. It's Sue Wyden from Lincoln. The psychologist, is it not true that we cut a psychologist from Mount A three years ago or two years ago? We had all those board meetings and we had a lot of passionate conversation about positions being cut in one of them. Was indeed a psychologist. Is that true? It's not anything I've heard, but I wasn't here two or three years ago, so I right. couldn't say. He was a behavioral interventionist. He was behavioral interventionist, yeah. It's a little different. Okay, just, well, you're talking all of those things, but. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 so, so talking a little bit more, and this helps explain some of these different things. So, those 6.3 coordinator coach interventionists, that again is about building that system of support. For the leaders, these are, these are those stakeholders that we identified in an earlier slide. So it's about building support for leaders, coaches, teachers, interventionists, and ultimately students. With a focus on STEM, humanities, and social emotional development. So the idea is we'd have coordinators, coaches, and interventionists for STEM. We'd have coordinators, co um, a coordinator, coach, interventionist for humanities, and then the same for social and emotional development. To provide that embedded ongoing professional development to help folks continue to move along that continuum of implementation of best practice. Doing away with the one or two day conference and come back and like, that has a, a use to a point, but it doesn't transform instruction. Ongoing embedded professional development over the course of years transforms instruction. So that's really where we need to, to be investing that. Um, sure. Uh, I'm Tom Larmouth out of Moncton. I teach at Mount Abe. I've taught for 30 years and I'm the president of Anita which is the uh, North, uh, Addison Northeast Educational Association. Um, we believe that eliminating the 16 support staff positions is really gonna have a negative impact on student outcomes. Um, and the main reason because is uh, the, the way that uh, my colleagues and I see it is that struggling students really require more time in direct education. Uh, and direct instruction. And uh, classroom teachers, we feel, already have great skills in dealing with students who struggle, but um, they don't really have the time to do it, to do the, offer the individualized instruction to individual students. And currently, we don't really have much confidence that adding coordinators and coaches and interventionists can make up the time with the students that currently that time is being supplied by support staff. Um, and so we'd certainly like more information as to how the ad added personnel, the leaders, the coaches, can really compensate for the time required to deal with the individual students. Uh, and then finally, the last thing I'd say is that um, 
We also now are all recognizing the impact that trauma has on student success. And we really feel it's important to realize that uh, trusted personal relationships, uh, and they all require time, individualized time, that they're the crucial element in overcoming trauma. And so uh, that's, that is our main concern, is moving these frontline people who interact with students and spend time with students, where are we going to get that time back? Where are the students going to get that time back? That's the real question for us. And the answer to that question is multifaceted. The bottom line is building the systems is going to provide the support that the students need, so they need less of that time individualized ongoing, especially by the time they're getting into 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And that's what we don't quite have confidence in yet. We'll, we'll instill confidence in us about how these leaders are, are again, actually going, like how is that interventionist when I have a student who needs to leave my classroom to take a test because they need that test read to them. They know the information, but they can't read the information off a test, or they can't write the information, but they know the information. When I have a class of 20 students, and I have a student who needs to test outside, will that interventionist be there for me? Will that coach be there for me? How's that going to happen? And, and uh, multiply that times all the teachers in the system. And so part of the approach with the model is thinking about um, not only how do, we, how do we strengthen the intervention portion of the system, but really how do we strengthen core instruction? Because, so... It's time though, again, I, I, have, I believe I have the skills, and if I, if I could sit with this student, it, it wouldn't be an issue. But because I have 19 other students, I can't sit with this student and spend the time with them that they, that they need to master that particular concept. And, and so again, that, that is my crucial issue, is that skills, I believe skills, I think we have lots of skills, you've spoken to the skills we have in our staff, so, but the time is the issue that, again, you eliminate 16 people times their seven hour day, that's, that's a lot of time, it just got eliminated. I mean, it's, it's really a, a difference, it's about looking at the system, which is really the, that's the focus that we've been taking as we try to think about how do we strengthen the system, and a big part of that system is that core instruction, which ideally reduces the number of students that have that level of need. Um, and so you, when you're making that transition, it's really hard because you're sort of caught in the now um, and the immediate need, but trying to build for the future and strengthening that. So, so an example, there are, there are best practices in teaching that are proven with lots and lots of research studies over decades to improve outcomes for students that aren't happening in every classroom and every school. Because, not, not through any fault of anybody, but through an absence of systems and an absence of a system of support to ensure that those things are happening. Um, if we can get those best practices happening consistently in every classroom and every school, then we're building that system of support so that fewer students are getting to that point of need um, and ultimately, in the end, that improves outcomes for students. And simultaneously, we're structuring the way that we're supporting students who do have need beyond that. So that, as you said, and I completely agree with this, learning cannot be the variable in the equation. Learning has to be the constant. Time and support have to be the variable. So philosophically, I, I'm right there with you. It's a matter of how we get to that point where we may differ a little. Doug Tolles from your Haven. Uh, tell me where I got this wrong. You're anticipating the reduction of 20 full-time equivalents. Correct. And that's going to yield a staffing savings of 675658 so. Correct. That's the education and spending reduction. Okay. So not necessarily expense. All right. Because I, I think you just answered. I was about to say uh, your teachers and benefits certainly cost well more than $35,000 per year. Right. So how can it be, maybe you could fulfill, fill that out a little bit. How do we get the net to be oh, less than 35000 a year because sure. with that health insurance alone, that's half, more than half of that. So a number of those positions are in the area of special education. And so expenses in the area of special education are reimbursed at a rate of, I think, 56%, um, at least 56%. And then uh, for extraordinary costs, they're reimbursed at 90%. So there's a revenue, and you'll see when we get to some of the, fu the future slides, there's a, re a revenue reduction that happens uh, as well as 
the expense reduction. So those sort of offset one another and produce the education spending savings, which is that figure that you were looking at. So because of the subsidy, these are, if you'll excuse the expression, less expensive employees on that basis. Because, because there's a revenue attached to them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think I saw this hand first. Um, Julie Olson. I'm wondering if you could walk us through what a coach would look like in a, in a classroom. Like, would, would they be there for weeks at a time, or is that when you want to get Sure. So, what I'll start with is there's a lot to figure out in terms of exactly how we want coaching to look. We have some coaches in some positions right now, but in terms of building a coaching support model right now, it's really pretty dramatically understaffed to say that we're doing coaching in our schools. Uh, we need to really build that to be able to assess the, the, the coaching model to see if it really works. The vision is that coaches are working directly with teachers, classroom teachers, coaches are working with interventionists, and they're coordinating this implementation of best practice, facilitating looking at data, all those sorts of things that we identified earlier as areas of focus for the system. So they're in classrooms, working directly with teachers, they're working with groups of teachers in small groups, they might lead some professional development uh, on some early release days and in in-service days, uh, so they play a key role in that job embedded ongoing professional development. Can I just follow up? Have you had conversations, you and your you keep saying we, and I'm not sure who we is included. Like, have you talked to all the professional staff in the district to say, what are your needs? What, like, what do you feel like we're lacking? How can we help you? And, and done like a survey to sit, to get the idea that coaching is really the best answer for everybody? I mean, I feel like they're already there. They're a great resource for you. They're gonna give you a great insight of, yeah, the two-day thing isn't working for us. And we, so that, for me, I feel like you want them to be supporting these decisions that you're getting ready to make. So you have to sell it to them, and you need to actually interview them to see what their needs are, right? Or we look at decades of research. Okay. <laughs> so the instructional coaching model has a very strong research base that suggests that when implemented well, it has a tremendous impact on outcomes for students. And we've dabbled in it some, um, but it's something that as an administrative team, we believe can really bring great benefit to students, and we need to invest in growing that. So the dabbling, have you surveyed the teachers who have been dabbled with to say, is this working for you? Do you feel like you're getting? So we've been looking at data. And so, and, and the data sort of ranges, but we see some evidence that instructional coaching is having a positive impact. Uh, and we need to understand where is it working well, where is it not working well, and why, and we need to replicate how it's working well. Can you explain which other school districts regionally are using this model? Uh, Champlain Valley has instructional coaches. Um, that's one that comes to mind off the top of my head. How about Middlebury, Addison Northwest, uh, what's interesting. Central, Chittenden East, Chittenden, it, over here. I mean, so it's a widely done model. Are there, there are 20, 30, 40 districts that are already doing this model, or is it CBU? Or which so, are this of? So coming from Madison Central, I worked there for a few years before coming here, and <clears throat> we hired a consultant there to act as a coach who came several times throughout the year to provide that instructional coaching to teachers. Um, over five years, we paid this consultant to come and do that work. And in year one, it didn't transform instruction. In year two, it didn't transform instruction. In year three, maybe it started to, but it wasn't until year four or year five of the same consultant working with the same group of math teachers, essentially, coming to that school, uh, providing that ongoing embedded application of best practice that it transformed instruction in the math classes. So it's not the same kind of coaching model that we're talking about. It was somebody from the outside that we hired to come and they came and then they left. This is more about taking that concept and really building that so that we can do it across content areas and we build that capacity in-house rather than relying on outside sources. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Tom. No, I forgot. I got it. Thanks. Uh, I'm sorry. So the variable, that, the big variable is if it's done right with the coaching. So that's, that's one thing. Being in Champlain Valley, their coaching model has changed over time. Um, but I guess my question is sort of a follow-up. Is this coaching idea coming from the, the teachers saying, hey, this is what we need? Is it more like the administrative team said, hey, we heard this 
things, and we've seen that it works elsewhere and it's coming down. Because my concern is if the teachers don't buy in, you can have all the resources in the world, and if a teacher doesn't use it, or a teacher doesn't want it, like even if they need it, they don't want it, and they say no, it's not going to be as effective as it. So I'm kind of I'm wondering where where the buy-in is and where it's coming. So the, the start of the coaching model predates me. I don't know what led to that, but the conversation now hasn't really been grassroots teachers saying this is what we need. No, to be fair. This has been an identified need at the administrative level and a way to meet a need that's being seen as we look across schools and, acro and across classrooms. I, I will say this in, in support of it. I know when Katrina moved from Bristol Elementary to uh, Central and was doing the coordinating, a lot of changes happened but, but that I saw were for the better. So that was an example of where it worked pretty well. So I'm just curious if that got some buy-in and then they said, oh, we need more of this. And, so I have several heard teachers, a lot of teachers saying we need more coaching. Now. OK. Well, several teachers complimented the work that she was doing. Well, and seeing as you called me out, can I just add a couple of things? <laughs> sure. um, um, uh, we aren't making up this coaching model at all. There's actually um, Jim Knight and Peter DeWitt's work on instructionalcoaching.com is really where we started thinking about how can we help meet needs uh, that the teachers are asking for in another more consistent way. So we've tried to um, at least start to train a small cadre of already existing staff in our district to learn the ways of that instructional coaching model. And to Mark's question, there are about 12 supervisory unions and districts um, in the region from us all the way up to Franklin County who are participating in this model. So we've been um, gone to, we've attended three different in-house trainings that have been provided from CVED, our regional professional development group. So we're not making it up. We're, we've been doing book studies. We've been thinking about what's working, what's not working. We have anecdotal stories from some of our teachers about things that are working well. But without that system and that structure and that vision that the strategic plan is going to offer us and what it is that we're going to help our teachers be held accountable to to help their kids the best, coaching is only going to be a solution to whatever it is the goals are that we need. So we're kind of waiting to see chicken egg. We're just trying to get up all of our resources in the right order so that we're ready to go as soon as, as, soon as we can. That's my two cents. Hi, Ari Kirshenbaum from Lincoln. Um, I just see that at, in terms of uh, support staff positions that are being eliminated, it seems like the majority are in um, uh, special education assistants. Um, exactly how are we going to meet the needs of those students um, in, in this new model? So the idea is through the model with um, greater access to professional interventionists and a more coordinated approach to intervention um, that will be able to meet those students' needs. Um, and the ratios right now, so we have, we have quite a number of special education support staff um, and it's in excess of what we need according to IEPs, et cetera, and when we implement um, this model and we have an increased access to special educators, um, that, that's gonna help accommodate for the reduction in the special ed support staff. So having full-time special educators plus the, uh, these coordinator positions available, you're, you're anticipating being able to meet those needs in a more efficient way. Can you speak louder? Because we can't always hear the questions. That so I, did, I just mentioned that uh, we anticipate being able to meet the needs of the students, um, these high-need students, uh, in other ways other than with the special education, the educator assistant. Thing. It's not something that you can say, oh, we'll just switch it with this person and 
expect like my daughter to adapt to having somebody new when it's more of her needs or her emotional connection with her aid would be somebody she knew for a longer period of time rather than somebody new that she never had to deal with before. <coughs> I mean, I think the two things you're bringing up are really important. That, that personal connection, that's really important. That will continue to have to be important as we work through this and ensure that people have the proper training to meet the needs of the students they're working with. That, that, that won't be any different as we have to work through this. Because her needs are going to change. Okay, so. <clears throat> so what I will say is that we have every confidence that through this model and the systems talk that we're, that we're talking about, that students with needs will have their needs met. And we believe perhaps even better than they are now. coaches that word kind of gets me a little tripped up. I like a consultant better because we're, it, it tells you that there's a level of expertise coming in to support teachers. And teachers aren't necessarily going to always want that um, and, and have resistance to it, but there's going to be a level of expertise to help people be more accountable and look at their teaching ways after teaching for long periods of time and having certain ways of doing things. I think there's a lot to this to, to really look at. At the same time, as somebody who's um, been paid for by the district to train paraprofessionals and invested a lot in doing that over the years, you have invested as a community in training those people. And you have some fantastic resource, I believe, especially in those bottom of the rung staff that people have been committed in the most difficult situations for a really long period of time. And I don't think that that's easily Replaced, and it does come out in rapport and trust and all the more sensitive things that people are bringing up. But um, I do, my concern about changes in staffing is how that's actually determined. That we don't just get rid of resources that we have invested in. It's also not fiscally responsible. Um, and I just also appreciate the notion that having something ongoing in the school, supporting and helping people be accountable, I think does really prove in terms of outcomes then the professional development system that we have right now, like going out, doing things here and there. The ongoing relationship with consultants and having people teaching teachers and teaching parents over and over about rapport, about trauma, about all these things, I think is a really terrific approach. <coughs> Dr. Tolson, can I just jump to the end here for a second? <laughs> back, back to the numbers. On your last slide, you have an educational tax rate of $1.64.9. At least that's what I see. Is, yeah. that, is that before the 8 to 12 cents that the initial lady spoke of? So, this is a resume that we're looking at this line here. And what was your statement after that? I didn't quite hear. Okay, stop. Right here. 
very nice lady who sits there, and I missed her name. I apologize. She said that the governor is looking at perhaps an 8 to 12 cent increase. I see you have an 8 cent reduction. I fully understand that. So is this $1.64 before the governor's, what well, I'm calling a 9 cent increase? So this would, this would incorporate what we're, um, the information we're getting from the state. So you can see if you look uh, across, so it's, it's, it varies um, town to town because last year every town had a different education tax rate, which was then um, adjusted um, by the CLA, which then produced a property tax rate. So here, sort of the, the comparison is if you look at Bristol, uh, the year we're in, 159.94, without the uh, Act 46 reduction would be 164.9. And then you can compare Moncton to Moncton. So you can see it's an increase, um, I think everywhere except for it was Lincoln, 168. Lincoln would have gone down without that. Okay, I'm going to go back to the other New Haven. I see $1.62.25, correct? Bottom line, New Haven. So that's before a, nine cent, a possible $0.09 cent increase from the legislature and the governor. No, I think this would, I'd have to double check on that, but I think that includes the factors from the governor. So what we're getting from the, so the state sets, um, and this is where there's a depth of conversation that I look to Howard sometimes to help me think through again because I always have to sort of reteach myself this. But the state sets a yield, uh, and the yield helps determine what the tax rate is. Um, and I don't think it's on here, but there's a certain amount where if you spend, it's $9,000 and some change, if you spend that much per student, um, then a $1 tax rate would get you that much per student. And then your actual tax rate is established based on how, what percentage over that 9,000 and change you're spending is. And that produces the rates that you're looking at here. So through that, I think the, the governor's information is included in what that number is set at. All right, so if, if, and I really hope you're right. If the governor's number is included, then the Haven would be looking at a, a slightly less than a five cent tax increase. We could be going from 157.67 to 162.25. Because from a, from a local education spending standpoint, these figures here reflect a reduced education spending amount. So it's the same per pupil, fewer, fewer equalized pupils, our education spending is going down. And even with education spending going down, which you'll see on a different slide when we kind of come back to the order, education spending from last year to this year went up a million dollars. So education spending from this year to next is actually going down by a few hundred thousand dollars, which still produces, in most cases, except for Lincoln, a few cents of an increase. So any, any, any spending above level, which is what you see here, adds to that tax rate increase before you factor in CLA and the Act 46 adjustment. If you do find out that the nine cents is not in there, let me know, because that way I can just kill over, because it'll be another thousand. <coughs> okay. Okay. You know, my tax is above 960 if the nine cents is not in there. Thank you. Uh, where were we? All right, I'm gonna go through some more slides. That'll prompt more questions, and we can have more conversation. So I think we've addressed this one, and we started talking about this, and that was really sort of that, that coordinator coach interventionist model that we're trying to build. Uh, we talked about the increase of special educators, um, and we didn't talk much yet about this uh, increase of a school psychologist. And that's really about strengthening that early intervention and prevention for both the academic but also the social and emotional supports, uh, which is an area that we see of need across our schools. So this is to help address some of those needs. So having two psychologists will increase our ability for psychologists to be working directly with students, not just doing assessments. And does early, does this early intervention mean working with the, early, the youngest population in our state? So that's part of what we need to think about. What's the best way to utilize that resource, uh, knowing that part of the piece of that, at least, if not more than a big piece of it, has to be strengthening that early intervention. And early intervention can mean early in that they're early in their educational career, or early in that, um, you know, as issues are sort of arising, we're sort of catching them early. Uh, Stephen Atosha from Lincoln. Um, one of the things you talked about was the staffing reduction anticipated, and you said six core classroom teachers. 
how do you decide which six? How does is that like the last to come into the district? Is it? It's it, determined by contract language. So what six that is is based upon following the contract language and a seniority list, which we're still we've got some things to work out on that. But um, but it's 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 pretty well prescribed by contract. So, but earlier you had stated timber stand improvement, and is that what a landowner would do? Is take the six trees that were maybe the youngest and cut those? I don't, I don't see that's a good analogy. Come on, I'm sprouting. I, it, I mean, that seems silly to me. You know, I, I, I really truly do, but I don't know, you brought it up and I just feel like that's not fair. It, 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 it's just the way it works. Like there, there isn't much of an alternative around that. That's contract language and we're, bound legally to contract language, and we'll follow that as we work through the process. I just think it was a bad thing to put in here. I, I, don't, I don't agree with it. Okay. Yeah. So, I'm going to come up there. I'm going to Sure. <laughs> Try not to follow her. <laughs> um, I just want to go off what he said. Um, hello. <laughs> I, I guess I'm just kind of wondering how it's going to um, save us money cutting people who are probably making, you know, the lowest of everybody, and bring in people who ideally would be very well trained with lots of experience and be very expensive, and maybe we're going to see them once a month if we're lucky, and if we're, I don't know, I feel like at least in my school in Bristol, um, we've been talking all year about how we're just treading water. And how is it going to help us to see somebody once a month when we're fighting every day to just get through? So we, we don't know at this point what the frequency is um, that folks will get to see coaches. And some of that depends on how much of it is time as a group, time, how much of it's time individualized. Um, but the treading water piece, I mean, we have to find ways to build support for teachers so it doesn't feel like you're always treading water. Um, and we have to, part of this is we have to think differently about what we're asking folks to do. Um, I think in particular about um, upper elementary school teachers who we ask to be experts in a lot of different things and have a great depth of content knowledge in a lot of different things. And as you're getting you know, toward that upper elementary uh, level, there is a, a certain depth of expertise and a depth of content knowledge that is expected. Um, and that, I think, contributes to people feeling like they're treading water. So we need to think differently about what we're asking people to do. We need to think differently about the kind of support we're providing to the teachers, but also the students, because it shouldn't feel like you're just treading water. So as we think about the, the reductions in staff that are proposed here, um, the question comes about what impact might that have on class size? I think that's, that's a, a, a wondering of a number of folks. So this is what the, the policy on class size shows. Uh, it's not super clean, but I'll walk you through it because there, it, it just sort of shows up a little differently in different places in the policy. So this sort of section over here is in a table in the policy. This is the, the state model that um, I think was adopted through policy. I'm just sort of I'm highlighting these three columns right here. So that. So it's looking at the grade clusters, which are K2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, 12. Then the minimum average student, uh, minimum average class size. Then the optimal average range for class size. Uh, and then in a different segment in the policy, it speaks to a maximum average of 20 for K2. And really, it's 20 through K3. This is where it's not super clean. 20 through K3, and then 25, 4 through 8. And then in, in the secondary level for core classes, it talks about how many students per teacher in that discipline. And for English, it's 100 students per teacher. And for other areas, it's 150 per teacher. So that's what the policy sets as the maximum. So I share that so you have sort of a basis for what you're going to see in terms of what the impact on class size is with the staffing reductions that are proposed. So currently, based on October 1, 2017 uh, data and projected kindergarten enrollment, uh, our current K through 6 
average class size is 16.87. With the five K through six classroom teacher reductions that we're proposing, that brings the average up to 18.4 which is an increase of 1.53 students per class on average. So of course this is looking at averages, there are variations from that, different circumstances in different schools, but that is the average class size. So the net effect of the reduction in classroom teachers is an increase of 1.53 students per classroom. Can I just clarify, sure. did you just say five K-6 classroom teachers? Correct. That's not something that we had heard before. That's I in, hadn't heard before. So it's in the, it's in the, there are five of the six core classroom teachers. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Patrick, I just have a question. I'm Kathy Smith, I'm from New Haven. I currently teach in Bristol. Um, in Bristol, we have four classrooms that are three, four multi-age. I believe Lincoln has some three, four multi-age and I believe also New Haven. Would we follow the maximum size of grade three of 20 students? or grade four of 25 students, because we're in the middle. Right. So, welcome to the, the world that had to sort of uh, figure this out. So. Well, I would think you would have it figured out before you published it. Well, the reality is, so it'll be different in different places, but the reality is we're gonna be well under those maximum limits anyway. So we'll still be within the optimal range for those grade levels. Would you repeat your last sentence? So you're, you're talking about the maximum. So which of the maximums apply? The reality is we're not going to be encroaching on the maximum numbers, really, as we make these changes in, in class sizes. We're going to be within the optimal average range still. I'm in the maximum currently. My classroom size. So that what you're talking about is a specific classroom versus average class size. But I'd be curious to know how you're going to handle the multi-age classrooms with that particular table. That's my question. So that's part of what we have to figure out. So it, it can be different in different situations, but we have to be looking at, our goal is to look at this optimal average range and to be within that optimal average range for that grade size. So you're saying that is not a completed table that you're instructing for boards to follow? This is in board policy as the optimal average range for class size. And we will be within the optimal average range for class size. But not multi-age. But not multi-age. In all class, so it doesn't differentiate if you're, a multi-age classroom doesn't have a different optimal average class size. Well, it does for the three four. You have two different you're maximum averages in the three fours. So my saying, question is just which one are we going on? And my, my answer is we're not going to be encroaching on the maximum average at all. So we're not going to hit any of those. <coughs> average across all school, all, all classrooms. So, it's really helpful to look at this from uh, across <coughs> all five uh, town perspective, but I, and at the same time, I, uh, I'm very curious because I, I, it must be true that you have projections for each school about what the grade configurations are going to be, the number of classrooms and what the grade configurations are going to be for those classrooms, and a projection about the numbers of kids based on what you know right now, given that some things will change and you may have retirements that you don't anticipate and so forth. But based on the best information you have now, I wonder if you could tell us by elementary school, what are the grade configurations and the class sizes for each of the classrooms based on what you know now? We can talk about what the current grade configurations are. We have some more work to do with what the ideal grade configurations should be as we work with the staffing that we're going to have. So that's not set in stone at this point, exactly what the grade configurations will be at each school and what that will produce for an average class size. But we are confident with the staffing that we would have that we would stay within the optimal average range. But can you, can you um, describe what you're at least anticipating now by schools in terms of um, how many kindergartens, how many kids in the kindergarten, what you're, what you're projecting as far as multi-age or single grade classrooms, I mean, what's your best guess, uh, given that it, it's not set in stone? I don't have that information tonight. I can't give it to you tonight. We have ideas, we have thoughts, and we're looking at kindergarten numbers, which are continuing to change. 
Um, and so it, it's, not, it's not set in stone now. And as new information comes, it's going to change it anyway. So we have ideas, uh, and we're playing some ideas out. And all of those ideas, we're confident, stay here. But I can't tell you by school tonight, standing here, what that configuration would be. If you can't tell us tonight, will the board be getting that information before it decides on a budget proposal? If that's something that the board is interested in getting, we'd be able to put that together. Um, whether that's what the board's going to want, I don't know. I think when that question had come up before, that there were a lot of changes in, in the in with teachers, so that it was hard to know even before August exactly what that was going to look like and who was going to be there and when. And so, I, I my thinking was that that wasn't something that we would be able to know right now. Is that that's yeah, I mean, that, I think that's a fair assessment. We don't. There, it can change quite a lot between now and when next school year starts, and we'll have to adapt to the change. We have ideas now, but for example, there are a few different grade configurations that could work in a school that stays within this average range. What the best grade configuration uh, for that school is is something we have to talk through more and figure out where we want to land with that. Sure, but speaking as a board member from Starksboro, and I've been on that board for a while, this is information that our board generally has received before we finalize the budget proposal. And when we receive the information, it's information that we understand could shift and change, um, but it gives us an idea of what the class sizes and grade configurations might look like given the staffing that we're about to propose to fund. Mm -hmm. And we could certainly put together what we know now, uh, which would be subject to change. I just don't have it tonight. Yeah. Thirty kids in an elementary school classroom. No, I, I don't either. But so, I, I do know classrooms vary from ten to twenty-three. As they do right now, yeah. Right. And so, I'm just wondering where the equity is with the classroom sizes that are much larger than others, and how that support is going to be. And that becomes part of the work we need to do as an admin team as we think about the grade configuration and what that does for class size and what kind of support those classrooms will need to, to do the work that they need. But it isn't, it's a, there are very few things with this that are very black and white. If A, then B. Uh, it, it's, I wish that were the case. It's just not the reality. There are a lot of moving parts and we need to think about how we can apply the resources given the situations. Um, it, it, that's just sort of the way it works, yeah. Can I just take you back on that? So just in terms of interventionists, you know, we have had so many different models in Lincoln of how we work with students. And from co-teaching, which has been, in my opinion, really successful, 
um, to having push in with special educators helping students with um, significant needs. Uh, with this new model, and um, my question is, will there be flexibility in how we uh, work with interventionists? Or is, are these interventionists, whoever these people are, going to have a specific um, uh, job definition that pushes them in one way where kids are, I mean, I'm just, yeah, anyway. That's a detail we have to figure out, you know. So what are we tight on and what, what can we be flexible on is part of the conversation that, that still has to come. So with the reduction in faculty at all the five, if you had five of the uh, elementary schools, what we, how you're going to accommodate for that is by collapsing classes, or at least not collapsing classes, that's the wrong word but rather uh, joining classrooms in classrooms that were previously just, for instance, just first grade or just second grade. So that, that's a clear change that we can anticipate in the future. Okay. Yeah, so there are also fewer students. So in some cases that may very well be true that there are multi-age classrooms, multi-grade multi -grade classrooms that didn't exist that will need to exist. Um, and in some places it's, it's not necessarily um, going to multi-grade because enrollment is going down. So again, it's different in different places, but it absolutely likely means more multi-grade classrooms than we have now as we look at grade configuration. Um, I just want to clarify. I think it's true that this, the budget proposal that you're outlining tonight is, has not been finalized and that this board is going to need two more times um, and in that, there's, there's another meeting after tonight, and then the, there's a, another um, final meeting, I think on January 23rd, where the board will be making a decision um, about the final budget that will be proposed to the communities. Is that right? That's correct. So the purpose of tonight is for the board to hear community input, and there's a survey that we'll talk about at the end that we would love for everyone to complete. Uh, and then the purpose of the added board meeting on January 17th is for the board to have had time between now and then to take information from the survey uh, and have that be a part of the conversation for the second time they're seeing the budget and talking that through uh, and then consider what direction they want to give to me in presenting a final budget on January 23rd. I'd like to say thank you to this format where there's been a give and a take and a conversation. I think the engagement around that has been so much more open and profoundly back and forth rather than um, more one side than another. It, it, there's more across this thing that sometimes happens. So I'm grateful. All right. More numbers. Huh? There was a slot Patty Heatherly Bristol. There was a slide that I saw before about 150 students, high school, an English teacher is going to have max a maximum of 100 students per year, and teachers who teach other subjects would have 150 students per year. So. Is that what that slide means? So this is about 100 on average per class. So we'll clarify that, for that just to make sure. Uh, this is sort of a maximum student load, a maximum class average load of English teachers being on average. 150 students for other subjects? As a maximum, according to what's in board policy. Uh, according to what's in What's in board policy. policy. So that's, board that's not a change. Now, that's not a change. This, is, this has been in place for some time. Oh, okay, well. Contractually, it's 120, though, so. Right, so the contract is sometimes no, different than what the maximum is. I understand that. Where, and, and the reasoning for those numbers, is there some research behind those numbers? I, I have to go back and look, but I believe these were also part of the model policy created by the Vermont School Board Association, which 
I can only assume is based on research, but okay, so I'd have to go back and see. I don't know. Very serious, serious because there's yeah. The contractual requirement is there. Tom just mentioned 120 is what the contract says right now is the maximum. But this is what board policy says. So we're operating under certainly under the 150. How many classes uh, are they teaching th that goes into that? I don't think that's a large number. I think that'd be quite. I mean, there's got to be X periods in a day and in a week. And you divide that by 150, and you don't end up with a class that's very large. So I, I think, I, just, I can't see what the problem is <laughs> with 100 or 150 there. I think that would be a matter of perspective. I <laughs> know. All right, let's get some more numbers, and then we'll take some more questions. So. So this is sort of looking at the overall ratio. Uh, there's a lot of conversation at the state level about, or at least there was, it's kind of died off a little bit now, but I suspect it'll pick up again, about um, total employees to students and that ratio. And so where we currently stand in Addison Northeast is one to 4.62. So for every 4.62 students we have, we have 1.0 FTE, and that's everybody, everybody, custodial, food service, uh, teachers, administrators, it's, it's everybody that makes up that ratio. And with the changes we're proposing, it would go from 1 to 4.62 to 1 to 4.87 or an increase of 0.25 students per employee. So enrollment is something that also comes up in, in conversation and I think somebody brought it up earlier, like what's happening with enrollment? Go back one slide. I could just ask a question. Oops, sorry. Does that ratio is that based on faculty that are dealing with students since they're side by side? Or does that include all staff, including all district office? Everybody's everybody. Every employee of the district, 300 some odd employees. So we're decreasing the number of teachers, increasing the number of non teachers. So the actual ratio of staff working with students is going down. Yeah, and more people in the district office. No. From the district office. We're all from the district office next year. No, that's right, because we're all one district. <laughs> okay, so the number of people what working on all of those students is going down. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Does that um, uh, staff student ratio include uh, subcontracted? Does not include any subcontracting. These are just employees of the district. Yeah. No subcontracting. Is it possible to see that um, number broken out by uh, what are the ratios of student to administrator? What are the ratio of student to teacher? What are the ratios of teacher to support person? I think it's that would possible. be much more meaningful information in the future. Anything's possible. For I don't have it for you tonight. For the next meeting? But that was, if that's a, I mean, that to sort of take some direction from the board. Uh, it would be difficult, as you can imagine, there are a hundred of us in here now, it would be difficult to get a hundred different perspectives on the same information to satisfy everyone. Yeah. I just wanted to comment that the Agency of Education has published numbers for all the schools in the state. It, of course, wouldn't be looking at proposed for next year, but you could look at um, kind of historical information. You can Google it or go on their website. They have spreadsheets. And they do break it down by student to teacher mm -hmm. and administrator to student to administrator. Awesome. And so you don't have to go to the Agency of Education's website. It's actually in our town reports, each individual town reports, the school, the school portion. And it has a three year running total. And they break it down by teacher to student. And there are specific definitions for each of those things. So. You can't look at teacher and have that, that the state has a specific definition. And you have to be very careful when you look at those numbers. But it's all in our town reports. Those are online on the um, district's website, or Supervisor Union at the moment, on their website under district reports. And you can see all of that information. And that's where it gets a little bit complicated. So if we try to break it down, we have to be really clear we're talking about the same definitions of what constitutes this and what constitutes that. 
looking at it this way, it's everybody. Everybody is everybody, and so in some ways it's cleaner, although not as precise. Well, I, uh, I like what you just said, and since you, there is a defined way it's in each of our books, I guess what my desire would be is what is the proposed for next year? You can just add one more column. Show us the last three years and show us fiscal year 19. This is the change. I mean, you know what that's going to be. They're all going to fall in the same buckets. So just that would be an interesting one just to understand that. Uh, my name is Samantha Gayhart, and I'm a teacher at Mount Olympia. And I as you pointed out, that if you're using contracted services, they're not included in those numbers. So one way to artificially drop the number is to use contracted services instead of direct employees. And so from my point of view, it makes those numbers irrelevant. You can't compare across different schools because different schools are using different types of contracted services. And it seems like this, this um, level funding discussion started with those ratios coming from the governor's office. So I just, I, I'd like to make that point. So, so I see that people are starting to leave, and that's fine, I understand we're getting to our end time. But before you go out the door, if you would stop in the back and fill out the little exit survey that would provide us with some information, that would be great. It's and there, right there on the back table. There's hard copy, and then if you don't want to sit here and fill it out with a pencil, you can take a little slip which has an electronic uh, survey monkey uh, link to it. And we're going to be putting all the hard copies into the survey monkey link. Um, so that'll save on some resources if you actually take the survey monkey link and do it. But make sure to fill it out, please. Okay. Um, Alice, I just want to ask you, with that breakdown, does it talk about custodial staff that works, doesn't work directly with students? Those are in those numbers. Administrative staff. You know, office staff. Everybody that is in the school are in those numbers. The, the town reports reflect that. The town report, is, I don't think it was custodial staff, kitchen staff, um, but, okay, so and we're other not, things. Uh, we're not uh, getting to say and IT staff <coughs> and that kind of thing. It's, and, and I'll also mention the Agency of Education has different definitions for the same word. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, but that, that 4.62, is that what that ratio is? So 4.62 versus 4.87, um, that's every person hired by the district. Um, and that's using who we have right now. Right, right now. So anything you and see on the project. state website or something probably does not reflect who we have right now. Um, I, I came back to this slide because we're talking a lot about ratios and um, as resources, education quality standards speaks to some ratios that they set as targets. Uh, the Pipers and Odin report talked about some ratios. District management, less about ratios, but, but to some extent about how, how staff are utilized. So as we looked at the staffing changes, these were resources that were really important in helping us figure out how, like, giving us a sense of reason. Are we reasonable in some of the changes we're, we're thinking about making? Um, and for every one of these, um, for every one of these ratios that you can look to in here, we're either at the suggested ratio or, or still above the suggested ratio for staffing, with the exception being in administrator positions. That's the one place where we were pretty much either right at or under staffed. Uh, in terms of what these were recommending. And despite that, we're still looking at making reductions there. So we, we the, the reductions that are proposed are factoring in the recommended ratios and we're still well above recommended ratios. All right, back to the numbers. So I think that's where we left off. So this gives you a little bit of a, a snapshot of looking back a little ways and looking ahead a little ways. I would just sort of um, offer that as you get further along this way, they become less and less reliable because it's, it's kind of a hard thing to really pin down. But you can see from a couple of years ago, a total enrollment of 1,460 to where we're projecting for next year, a drop of about 60 students enroll, which will continue to go down a little bit over the next couple of years before rebounding a bit um, when we have one small class that will graduate, which will hopefully be replaced by a larger kindergarten class. 
So where we are proposed for next year, dipping, rebounding back to pretty much where we are proposed for next year in terms of that total enrollment looking ahead. Um, so I felt compelled to put this in here because it's a question I've been asked before and it's a question that's probably on the minds of a lot of folks is given all of this, this, um, this work to find the savings, should we put off renovating Mount 8? And my response to that is no, I don't think that's the approach to take. And some of the reasons why I think that is that building upgrades have often taken a back seat when budgets have gotten difficult. And in particular, our high school building is at a point where it can't withstand putting off repairs any longer. Um, and in addition to that, the FY19 budget, which is what we're talking about, won't be impacted much by the bond. It's really the following year that we'll be making um, bond interest and principal payments. So it's the FY20 budget that will be more impacted by any approval of a bond. Um, and then you run the risk of not renovating. Um, so there's been a lot of conversation about why we should or shouldn't, but really there's a risk in not renovating. Um, and I think you don't have to look too far um, over the mountain to a school that had mold and had to close its doors for I don't know how long and have its kids educated somewhere until it got fixed. So I would hope that wouldn't happen, but given the water issues we've had and experienced in places um, at the high school, it's a risk I, I think we shouldn't be taking any longer. And the impact on teachers and students, if that high school couldn't continue to operate, is more significant than anything we're talking about right now. So taking care of the facility needs is really important. Uh, two things. One, uh, isn't the uh, forgiveness on the tax rate or whatever going down two cents in the second year from the eight to six? Yes. So and that'll be an increase in our taxes. And I noticed that in the reduction, you've got 300000 in maintenance and so forth. That's where we're voting on that, because over the years, they haven't maintained the school. And I may be wrong, but as I understood, the, the problem with the gym floor was uh, roof drains. That's my <coughs> And there's no reason for that. And so I just was a little disappointed to see 300000 in your cuts. Um, I'm in favor of renovations to what level, but anyway, um, I just think it's too bad when renovations, they've been put off for too long. And I can talk a little bit more about the 300,000. So to build FY18, uh, many elementary schools, and I think even the high school, added a fairly sizable amount of money to do some specific projects, duct cleaning being one consistent one in most of the schools, which is tens of thousands of dollars, potentially in each school. And so that 330000 is kind of bringing those increases back down to what they, they had been prior to that inflation to get those projects done. So it's, it's not taking from what was sort of bare bones maintenance and cutting from there. It's going back down to what we had been operating on. So it's a little less scary than what it looked like there. But, is it, but still not even beginning to address the fact that we put off things like duct cleaning for right. how long? Okay. Hi, thanks, Patrick. My name is Sandy Lee. I'm currently on the Mount A um, Union High School Board, so um, I'm not officially part of the budget process based on you know, our terms and come the end of this fiscal year. I wanted to first appreciate you know, the task of the Consolidated Board. They've stepped up you know, and they have a lot of work they have to do as a transition time. Um, and so I'm just going to raise some concerns. It's sort of interesting being on this side of not being on the board and getting information, um, and then knowing what it's like to be on the other side um, when you actually can get and can access more information. So some of the concerns I would have is that um, you're dealing with five elementary schools and a high school. And I, you know, and I realize this is all consolidated together. It was interesting listening to various questions such as um, how does this affect certain classrooms in one-on-one, and I'm thinking, oh, sixth grade down to kindergarten meets. And then I hear about the, you know, how in the past we had a behavior intervention, uh, interventionist, and it's true that was a couple years ago um, at the high school, and we eliminated that position with a lot of objection as part of the budget, but that had nothing to do with your administration, Patrick. Um, and that had to do with other needs that you see at the high school level that is different than what you see at the elementary school level. So the challenge I see is for the board, um, you know, this is maybe the second meeting they have really, they're here to hear the community input. You had a meeting to get a lot of the numbers and information. I think the challenge will be 
to really see and get the information on how it's affecting all the individual schools and how different that actually can be in terms of how is that going to impact the high school. Very sort of different situation. Um, making sure that you feel you have all the information so that a lot of the questions, when there are details that I think that the community feel really important, that, that you as a board can answer that, or with the help of um, Patrick, can answer these questions because otherwise, as a community, we feel sort of left with, you know, is there something I'm missing? If I had gone to that meeting, would I have had the same information? And there are additional board meetings that are happening, and I imagine there'll be fairly vigorous discussion, hopefully, about the very questions that the community raised, because there are significant cuts. And so the last, before I, um, the other piece I wanted to hit on, Patrick, is the, the idea of the um, instructional support model. It sounds very promising, and as a superintendent, I'm very much in support of uh, our policy governance process, which is that as our superintendent, you know, he is our leader and guides us in the direction so that we can meet the ends for our students. And I'm not an educator, I'm a board member, but I have to trust, and I do, that Patrick has done the work he needs to do, but as a board member, I also need to hear in my head and sort out, I see the pros of that process, but what are the cons when we lose the, I may have the number wrong, but I think it was nine point something uh, special ed assistance. What does that really mean, and what are the cons, and how are we really balancing the gains with the losses? Obviously, from the state, you know, at the governor's level, they put this terrible constraint on our budget, and we're all feeling it over the state of Vermont. And the question is, what can we do as a community? What are we willing to pay to say, we want to follow that model that you're suggesting, because that's, we want to move forward and continually improving our ends. But what are we doing to bridge the actual needs <coughs> when we all of a sudden don't have one or two or three student, you know, I mean, special assistant aides in the elementary school. And that to me seems incredibly significant. And you're going to have a gap between a, an instructional coach and the loss of the um, assistance. And how are we bridging that really? Because, you know, we don't want to lose children in the cracks. And so those are the kind of answers that I'm hoping as a community you will hear um, as we have these really important meetings. Because we are, we're in a tough time. You know, it's really hard to match the numbers with the needs of everyone with my book. We'd love to have a lot more money and, and do this instructional model and have our student assistant aides and special assistant aides and have it all. But, you know, we have to make some really tough choices. So I do appreciate it. That's so really hard thing to do. I really like that, too, the, the point about the details. And that's something I've thought a lot about. So knowing people want a lot of details, including myself, like I would love to have all the details now. That would just make things so much whether we like or don't like what the details would be, there's a, an aspect of comfort knowing what the details are. The reality is to have all of the details worked out for all of this by January 23rd when this board adopts a budget, the only way that happens is if I say what all the details are with no conversation with anybody. I'd much rather engage in conversation with the folks and think through what's the best way to do this to figure out those details once we know we have a budget and a staffing uh, level to work with. Um, and so that's the challenge with knowing people want the details um, and having ideas myself about what some of the details could be, but not wanting to just say, these are the details, this is exactly what we're doing, now everybody go and do it. So it's that sort of push and pull with the details. But part of the, I get the extent of the details, and it gets very, if you're not an educator, it gets very difficult to actually get lost a little bit in it. But part of it is just the assurance of the plan like just knowing, I don't need to know the exact details of every school necessarily, but what's the plan? What's the information I'm relying upon? What have my principals given to me? What assurances did they, because they're the ones in the building who know the students and know the teachers and know their staff. You know, what information can we be just assured that I have done this, I have confirmed, I have gotten at that time. But that's something I might ask in a board meeting that we have every month. But as a community, I think if you hear that assurance as well, really makes you more confident in that we, we can take the step. Um, I'd like to echo what Sandy said about the bridge between what we have now and this new program, this new system, uh, which you've talked about doesn't see anything in the first year, doesn't see anything in the second year, doesn't see anything in the third year, maybe the fifth year we're seeing. That's somebody's entire middle school to high school career. That's a kid's time from middle school to high school. So the bridge has to be there 
from this system. The bridge has got to be there. So when you pull these 16 people out, you have to figure out a way to support those kids until your new system is fully developed and is showing results. Otherwise, you've got a kid who's lost their entire high school career or their entire elementary career. And I thought I could speak to that a little bit. So I was in the district where um, Patrick was talking about we did an intensive consulting coaching model around math. And um, what I noticed as a teacher was that, um, that kids started to benefit right away, first of all, just because um, there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of, um, rich instruction that you can put right out there. You don't see it reflected in assessment maybe right away, but I would think that one benefit to a unified district is that I teach at a middle school, and when kids come to the middle school, they all had teachers who have the same expertise because it was provided through a program of shared instruction to the teacher. So then, everybody's on a level playing field. Everyone's had a similar math experience in this case. And they're ready to go. Um, and I'm a special educator. And that included all students. It really did. So I would say, from that aspect, it's really positive. I would say what's unfortunate is that um, these staffing cuts that we're talking about in Addison Northeast, it sort of feels like here they are anyway. These were handed to us by the state. This is a, this is an unfunded, here you go, and we're stuck with it. It's very difficult to implement some of the really rich stuff you get if there aren't people in the classroom to do the work. So it's like both. Um, both things are happening. You have great ideas, you have good information, maybe you know how to write those dynamic assessments that get you away from standardized tests. So all of a sudden, you have all this information about how to write a better assessment, but you can't get it done because somebody said you're swimming, right? You're just swimming. So that's where you need the help. And I would say that we have to trust um, the people who are calling, like the people who are talking and calling teachers and speaking with curriculum leaders. We really have to trust the board to write a great budget, <coughs> and we have to trust the superintendent and the administrators to implement it. And I actually worked for Patrick, and I feel like I do. I trust him. Like, this could work, um, and it could be a good model. I feel that way. I'm very concerned about cutting kind of staff, but I, that concern for me lies with the state. That's, that's what we got. And, um, I don't necessarily think that this board can fix that for us. I would say, for my part, um, those are the people who can hear my concerns about that. But um, I wanted to say that. I also wanted to say that um, for my own children in this district, the <coughs> one regret I have is teacher turnover. It's, that's been the biggest difficulty for my kids. My, my son is a senior. He's had four guidance counselors in four years. And um, so I want to thank the teachers, right? And I would really, where, where my money goes is write a good contract for these people. They are awesome and we want to keep them. So if we have good teachers, do whatever it takes um, to build their expertise, and get them to stay here. Thanks. Uh, Caitlin Christie, Williston, but I work in New Haven. Um, I want to stay. I want to stay. I, do, I don't want to be turned over. I want to stay. Um, my question, though, is why, what's the reasoning behind the five positions taken from K-6, and I'm assuming the one from uh, the 7 12? So the difference between K6 and 712 is, so we can, we can look at different um, grade configurations and things like that. It doesn't necessarily change program offerings to students. When you start adjusting uh, and you start eliminating personnel, core teachers at the secondary level, that also means potentially 
there are programs that are no longer provided to students. Um, and so we were trying to, to find a way to make the redu reductions necessary, stay within the class size guidelines in the, um, in the board policy, and stay within the ratios that were suggested by those reports, and try to find a way that we're not reducing programming offered to students. Um, I mean, fewer English teachers at the high school would mean fewer course offerings. So if you reduce too much in the English department in the high school, can you have AP English? You have to have a certain number of people to offer uh, the breadth of programming that we're looking to offer students. Whereas at the elementary level, your class size may go up, but kids are still going to get the, the, the subjects. I'm a little concerned as a skeptic about our, our consolidation on certain levels. I'm a little concerned that the board is missing, what, four or five people? A third of the board is not here. I think it might be good to consider alternate, alternates, a way to, to make sure that if this is the one and only board that we have in this district that's representing a lot of people and a lot of students, that we try to keep that board full. And if people aren't here, get other people to be here. Um, and I know that the state has, uh, in our negotiations last year, the state sort of threw us a lot of curveballs. And I think you've done an admirable job of making a case for or, you know, doing the best that we can do, given the limits that they're putting on us. I would just say that perhaps we, next year or in the future, let's not be slap, let's not uh, kowtow to what the state is trying to put over on us. Um, I mean, I think we get a lot of bad stuff coming down from the state and we don't necessarily need to, to uh, follow what they put down. <coughs> One other thing is on Saturday, I just wanted to mention there's a bunch of us that are organizing <coughs> Some of us are here. We'll, we'll, we're going to have a, a meeting at uh, Bristol Elementary School starting at 8.30 <coughs> to discuss Mount A at the Middle and High School uh, and uh, how it fits in to a broader conversation about our resources, our students, how we can do the best we possibly can uh, for them and for our future. So if you're interested in in that broad topic, please join us on, on Saturday. Somebody here might want to add more, I don't know. But thank you. I want to address the board. Um, I'm thinking a lot on this. My name is Deb Rickner. I'm the art teacher at Bristol Elementary School. I've been teaching, I live in Moncton. Um, I've been teaching at Bristol Elementary School for 27 years. I've seen a lot of changes. I've seen a lot of changes in the schools. I've seen a lot of changes in how teachers teach, how they've been told to teach, how they have to teach. I've seen a lot of huge changes in society. And I really need to understand why in a year when you're, you need to cut a million dollars, why is that the year why we need to introduce a whole new system of teaching the teachers when we're losing all these critical people in the schools that are working with the students. I've seen this year a lot of decimation in terms of the staff, not enough people working with the students so the other students can learn. And um, what I wanted to say is that a school is a community, or the entire community. Um, this process that's going on here is decimating and demoralizing our community right now. I've never seen such stress in school right now. Um, the children and the staff uh, thrive from regularity, from year to year, same basis. People who know they can get a hug from, that they can trust, that, they can, that they're going to be there. Yes, we need to improve our outcomes, we know that. Um, but tearing apart the community is not the answer. Supporting the community in the classroom, directly intervening with students and working with students is key. And I don't understand why, if we need to satisfy the governor's numbers, why it has to be cutting 
critical people whose heart and soul are in the schools working with the students. And I think that there needs to be some, something addressing that. So, a few more numbers. So this is sort of a breakdown of the expenditures. So this is that total expenditures line. Of all the expenditures, just under 21 million would be categorized in, in the area of instruction and support. So that's 72.7% of our budget is really directly about teaching and learning and working with students. Three million, a little over three million for leadership and business, about three and a half for facilities. Transportation is just under a million, and our food service with that $22,000 reduction goes down to $173,000 out of the general fund to support the food service. Uh, I just thought this sort of puts into context where we put our money um, for education, and you can see the lion's share is in supporting teachers and supporting students. So this is a little bit more on that with some comparison. So again, there's our target education spending. So you can see in FY17, our total expenses. So again, this is not education spending. This is total expenses, 28 million 320. And we can sort of follow that across. That increased to 30 million 088 for the current year, which is an increase of 1.7 million in expenses. And for FY19, the expenses are reduced from FY18 by 1 million 331. So then we look at our revenue. You can see our revenue increased from last year to this year by almost three quarters of a million. And our revenue is going down for FY19 by over 900,000. The two driving factors in this reduction of $900,000 is we had a fund balance carry forward um, that was about $600,000 less to apply to next year's budget than what we had to apply to this year's budget. So we talked before about the one-time funds at the state level creating some of that gap. Well, one-time funds for us locally is the application of fund balance applied to the following year to offset taxes. So for this current year, $1.5 million was applied from a fund balance revenue to offset the tax rate for this year. We don't have the same $1.5 million to apply next year. We have $600,000 less of that. And so that accounts for 600 of the 936. Most of the, the rest of the reduction comes in special education. We talked about that before. With a reduction in expenses in special education, you also get a reduction in revenue from special education. And those two make up the lion's share of that 900,000. There are a number of other things that make up little parts and pieces, but that's sort of a big story there. So when we look at the difference now, so education spending, which is total expenses, less revenue, 23,861 in FY17, went up by about a million dollars, as I mentioned before, to FY18, and is going down by almost 400,000 for FY19. And then we look at what's happening to equalized pupils. We saw the enrollment trend earlier, and we saw that kind of go down, and it's going to kind of pick back up to uh, projected levels for next year and a few years. But when we look at equalized pupil, which is huge, because each one of these equalized pupils represents about $16,000. So we dropped from FY17 to FY18 by 58.22 equalized pupils. You multiply that by $16,000, that's a significant change um, in the cost of equalized pupil. And then again, to, to this year, projector for FY19, for this budget cycle, dropping another 24.76. So that's over 80 equalized pupils reduced over the last two years times $16,000. It's almost a million dollars less, um, less spending. And so you can see that the cost for equalized pupil, FY17 was 14977 for equalized pupil. Uh, with that decrease in equalized pupil and not making adjustments last year that, that could have been made, I suppose, increase the cost for equalized people by $1,200. And so the direction from the board to me as a target was keep FY19 equalized pupil spending the same as FY18. Well, I didn't. But I'm close at $4.97 more than last year. That's about a $7,512 um, 
total over target, over this. So I'm at $7,500 over that target right now based on everything we've been looking at. Uh, so where was the state trip wire for the double vote? The state trip wire, I don't even know that it's a double vote anymore. They've sort of been changing what you have to do when you cross that spending threshold. But the spending threshold at the state level is 17800 significantly more than our current FY19. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And so then to the tax rate. And so as we, as we were talking about, so these are the tax rates before CLA for the year we're in now for each town. Uh, sorry, from here over. These are the tax rates proposed based on what we're looking at here with this budget. Um, and you can see there were different tax rates for each town last year. Now is it because each town was its own district. As a unified district, we have a single tax rate for all of our towns. So that's one change you'll notice here. Then we have the Act 46 adjustment, which of course we didn't have for the year we're in now, which I keep referring to as last year, but it's actually now. Uh, and then we have this eight cent reduction from the tax rate because of passing Act 46. And as you mentioned earlier, that would be six cents the year after that, four cents, then two cents, and eventually that goes away. So the adjusted education tax rate, so these are the same as they were up above because there was no adjustment to that, um, at least not until CLA. So this becomes the adjusted tax rate after the eight cents comes off. So then you have the common level of appraisal for each town. And basically what that is, is it's a way to try and sort of e equate home values to what they would be in a fair market value. So what this basically says is for the year we're in now, Homes in Bristol are assessed by the town at about 91.35% of what their fair market value is in the real real estate world. And so that's an adjustment to the tax rate to accommodate for that. Lincoln, it's saying, Lincoln has their, their homes assessed over what fair market value is because it's over 100%. And so that, when, when we're, so we're gonna be dividing by these. So you take this figure, divide by this, and that gives you your property tax rate. Um, when you divide by less than one, it's going to increase. When you divide by more than one, it's going to decrease. And so that's the factor that CLA has. So even though we have a single tax rate, each town still has its own common level of appraisal. And that's why you'll see different tax rates. So here's the adjusted tax rate before CLA. Then you have the compounding factor of common level of appraisal, which produces this estimated property tax rate. And you can see it's different for each town. And for some towns, it's a significant decrease. Um, and in other towns, it's less of a decrease. And something just came out from the state today about there's a, um, an increase can't exceed 5% from the year before. It doesn't look like that's going to have an impact on, on ours. But there's a lot of questions, more questions than answers in terms of how that 5% applies. So our business office and I are working with folks to try and understand that a little bit more. Yes. Paul Valenza from Lincoln. Um, I appreciate this presentation. The net of it for me is there's some pain and some gain. How do you, excuse me, how do you determine that across the, the schools? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, um, you're, you're, um, there are going to be fewer teachers, okay? So I, I imagine, based on what you referred to, the contract, that you have no say over that. It's already predetermined. If you have one school losing more teachers than another, how do you, is there some mechanism to sort of equalize that, if you will? And do you take into account that some schools are losing more students than other schools? So one of the benefits as, as a single district will be, you know, as we look at, at staffing, we're looking at equity across schools. Um, and as a single district, to be able to achieve that equity across schools, we would have the flexibility to assign staffing to different places to realize that equity. Um, and so that's part of the lens we'll have to take as we figure out uh, exactly what next year looks like. So that it isn't, you know, one school has an average class size of 11 and another has an average class size of 27 to give us the total average across. Like we have to look at. Um, at equity across schools in a lot of different ways. So there, there are a number of different components to this concept of equity that we have to look at with different lenses as we apply um, allocation of resources across schools.
That's the last slide. Just a, a comment on common level of appraisal because somebody had commented earlier, oh, New Havens is going up about five cents. Two of that five cents is just because their common level of appraisal dropped. So two of that five cents has nothing to do with any change in the budget. It just has to do with the fact that you're that much further away from doing a town-wide reappraisal. Your, your appraisals have gotten more out of whack. That's all we're taking yeah. responsibility for. It. Yeah. So obviously, it's, there's a ton to digest. Sort of my my statement has been it's complicated. This is this is really messy stuff. It's really complicated. Um, it's very emotionally charged. There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, but I think this kind of conversation, which will be an ongoing conversation, is the only way that we can work through this. So I certainly thank you for being here and engaging in the conversation. They're great questions. I know I don't have answers to some. I don't have all the details. Um, but I know that working with folks, we can, we can get through to something that's going to be good for kids. We have to. We have no choice but to do that. to finish up the board business. So we're a little more confined by that. Um, at this point, is there anyone have a public comment they'd like to make at this time? Yes. It's, it's really a question about town meetings. In the past, there, each town has had their own school board, and the school board has uh, discussed what their budget is in town meeting, which is very, very useful. Do you, have you thought about what's going to happen in town meeting so, now? So we already have scheduled. It's the last Tuesday, February 27th. Um, and it will be, I'm not sure on the time because the Mount Abraham board will still have their final meeting that night as well. So we have, that will be the t our town meeting night. Um, and like the Mount Abraham budget, it will be uh, a meeting held to discuss in one location, which I don't think we, I don't remember if we determined when we set it up. So, so February. If I understand you correctly, the actual town meetings will not have any discussion about uh, the consolidated school. That, that hasn't been settled, so, uh, so can I make a recommendation? I'm on the select board. We are going to lose people if you don't have somebody there talking about what's happening in the consolidated school. And so I suggest, People have a hard time going to multiple meetings, uh, but a lot of people come to town meeting. And I would suggest that there ought to be a board representative at each of the towns for town meeting. We, that's on our agenda to discuss and plan for that around how we're going to work it out for moving forward. So. And I can also stop for, that for this next town meeting, the, the local school districts, so the local school boards will still be present. There still has to be an annual meeting it'll just be a sort of a different flavor because typically the big conversation is about the next year's budget, which isn't, isn't really owned by the local boards anymore. So sort of a different context, but there'll still be a school board and an annual meeting and all that. Yes. My name is Bill Sayre. I live in Bristol. I'd like to commend you for your presentation tonight and also for the work of the board in putting together a very difficult budget to address an extremely difficult problem. Nobody likes to lose teachers. We all have appreciated the teachers that our children and grandchildren have had, but at the same time, really do have to bear in mind the, the terrible strain of our Vermont economy is under. Losing six people from our labor force every single day, three students, is significant. Never mind the baby that's born opiate addicted every day. 
any other service or business that loses customers, loses 30% of their customers, uh, has to reduce staff. It's a uh, unavoidable conclusion. And we've not, as a state. Matter of fact, our, our student population has gone down 30% over 20 years, and our, our staff has gone up. I know in each case there was probably a good reason for that, but we've got to the point now where the cost to the taxpayer is simply unsustainable. And one of the reasons our economy isn't growing is because some people have decided to move to another part of the country where their taxes and property taxes are lower. And businesses grow their companies in other parts of the country where their taxes are low. So if we want to start reversing the trends that are underway and that are, are affecting us adversely, we have to adjust our spending to match uh, the revenue that we can sustain. So I thank the board for their good work. I recognize this is a hard choice for everybody in this room, uh, but it's one that we have to make. Thank you all for staying. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.